Today we're going to talk about the brain. This is a relatively nice standard model that a lot of you have. So let's take a look first at the lobes of the brain. Um, and to find these lobes, it's probably a good idea to look at some general landmarks. So this landmark here is called the central sulcus. And that is going to delineate the frontal lobe of the brain from the parietal lobe of the brain. So the parietal lobe is back here. It doesn't go all the way to the back, however. At the very back of the brain, we have the occipital lobe. And the occipital lobe is actually distinguished from the parietal lobe by a little sulcus right here, which we simply call the parietal occipital sulcus. Another lobe of the brain is the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe is separated from the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe by the lateral sulcus. You can also see that there are various bumps on the brains and depressions. These bumps are called gyri, and the depressions are called sulci. Anterior to the central sulcus, there is an important part of the frontal lobe that is referred to as the precentral gyrus. And the precentral gyrus is responsible for voluntary motor control. The postcentral gyrus is here. This is part of the parietal lobe, and this part is uh, used for sensory detection. Another fairly obvious part on the brain is the cerebellum. And of course, this is almost like a little brain behind the brain. And we'll talk about that one in a little bit. In addition, we have the brain stem. And the brain stem, of course, is made of the pons and the medulla oblongata. Anteriorly, the pyramids of the medulla oblongata, where crossing over occurs. And then this region above the pons is referred to as the midbrain. When I show the sagittal section of the brain, we'll see this a little plainer. The brain, of course, is divided into two hemispheres, and this is the longitudinal fissure that separates the left part of the brain and the right part of the brain. The brain is not symmetric in that the right part and the left part have different regions. Um, of course, you probably have heard of cerebral dominance, uh, people that are right-handed have a dominant left side of the brain. People that are left-handed have a dominant right side of the brain, which means that people that are left-handed are in their right minds. Let's take a look at the sagittal section of the brain. So again, let's take a look at the pons. It's an obvious landmark. The pons is actually a respiratory center, among other things. There's also pontine nuclei for some cranial nerves here. And then we can go down to the medulla oblongata, and then above the pons is the midbrain. Now, a couple features of the midbrain include the corpora quadrigemina. That's these two bumps here. Corpora quadrigemina means the four twin bodies. And so we'll see two on this side. The upper one is referred to as the superior colliculus. And of course, there's a matching body on the other side of the brain. And this is for visual reflex. And the one down here is called the inferior colliculus, and that is for auditory reflex. You can also see uh, some part of the brain here that is referred to as the diencephalon. This is the hypothalamus. Many things go on in the hypothalamus, including regulation for emotion, temperature, hunger, thirst. Um, the hypothalamus also manufactures hormones that are stored in the posterior pituitary gland, which we'll see shortly. And um, it also is responsible for making regulatory hormones for the pituitary gland as well. Right here is the thalamus. Now, before we go any further, I'd like you to take a look and see a bird face here. Can you see the face of the bird? Hypothalamus would be the beak of a bird. The thalamus would be the face of the bird. And then this little thing here, this little piece of tissue that connects the left and right thalamus together is referred to as the inner thalamic adhesion or intermediate mass. That's more or less the eye of the bird. The bird has a nice crest on it right here. And this little crest is the fornix, which is the white matter of the limbic system. Now if we look at the large crest of the bird, we see the corpus callosum, and the corpus callosum is the white matter that connects the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. There's also a little tassel on the bird here. 
And this little part is going to be part of the choroid plexus where cerebrospinal fluid is manufactured. And then down here would represent maybe the pineal gland, which is the gland that helps to regulate sleep-wake cycles. The face of the bird, or thalamus, is also a ventricle. And this is actually the third ventricle. Third ventricle uh, comes down at the neck of the bird here. So this little windpipe, so to speak, on the neck of the bird. That's going to be called the cerebral aqueduct, which connects the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle that we see here in the region of the cerebellum. Beyond the fourth ventricle, we basically uh, have the uh, region that is going to become the spinal cord, and the interior of the spinal cord is going to have a little hole in it called the central canal. Recall that the thalamus is the face of our bird, and the thalamus again stores cerebral spinal fluid, being since that it is the third ventricle. It has its own choroid plexus, as I mentioned earlier, as do all the other ventricles, the fourth ventricle and the lateral ventricles that we'll see soon. The function of the thalamus is really the relay center for the spinal nerves. Afferent axons travel to the various nuclei of the thalamus, and these in turn communicate with the various lobes of the cerebrum. The term afferent means traveling toward the central nervous system. Take a look here. This right above the little crest and the big crest, the corpus callosum and the fornix, is a thin wall that is called the septum pellucidum. And that septum pellucidum separates the lateral ventricles. We'll see the lateral ventricles in just a moment, but before I get there, I should talk a little bit more about the cerebellum. The cerebellum is, of course, kind of the tail of the bird, and um, it has some white matter in it, which we refer to as the arbor vitae, which translates to three, tree of life. Now, this, of course, is the primary uh, white matter for the cerebellum, which is regulatory for muscles as well as motor memory. Above the corpus callosum is the cingulate gyrus. Cingulate gyrus is actually considered part of the limbic system. And this is a place where we make decisions, sort of unconscious decisions. When you go to bed at night and you say, oh, I think I'm going to sleep on that and give me an answer in the morning, uh, it's this little area that's sort of working over time. Also a pleasure center uh, in the brain. All right, let's go to a different model. It's basically the other half of the one I just showed you. And we'll take a look at the lateral ventricle here. Remember, this was separated by the septum pellucidum. We have one on either side, so there are two lateral ventricles. Again, they have their own cerebrospinal fluid. If we look inside the lateral ventricle, we see an area that is actually one of the basal nuclei. This is the caudate nucleus. The caudate nucleus is a rhythmicity center. It's also a very important region for memory. Now I'm going to take this little model apart, and we're left essentially with the brain stem. And maybe we can zoom in on that just a little bit. Now that we've removed the brainstem, we can see, again, this medial basal nucleus, which is referred to as the caudate nucleus. Again, a rhythmicity center, and also an important area for memory. People that have super memories have, oftentimes have super large caudate nuclei. On the lateral side, we have two basal nuclei. The upper one is referred to as the putamen, which is also a rhythmicity center. And the lower one is the globus pallidus, which is used for starting and stopping actions. So if I want to pick up a pencil, uh, this particular nucleus helps to set the muscle tone for that. Between the basal nuclei is a series of axons that travels to the cerebrum. And these are referred to as the internal capsule or the corona radiata. Now, if we take a look again at the lateral side, let's go back to the midbrain region. These flutations are called the cerebral peduncles. They are motor funiculi, which are sent from the frontal lobe of the brain toward the spinal cord. So we can see them quite plainly here in the midbrain region. 
This is the optic nerve, and you can see right below the optic nerve is the pituitary gland. It used to be known as the master gland, but now we know that the hypothalamus is its master, so this is more of a manager gland, I guess we could say. And then we have the olive, and the olive again is responsible for registering the stretch of muscle. This little tiny bit of the cerebellum is called the flocculonodular lobe, which actually helps to give us a sense of balance. Well, that ends the first video on the brain. In the second video, we're going to take a look at some functional regions of the brain, the pyramids of the medulla, and even some cranial nerves.